You're listening to the Retrospection section, where we review terrible writing we were once proud of. I'm Max, here with my co-host Rava, and we love to make fun of ourselves and now other people. In this episode, we will continue reviewing Tyra Banks' novel Model Land, in which a strange girl attends a mysterious school atop a mountain, somebody eats a pancreas, and there are horrific instances of wanton violence. Sit back, relax, and cringe with us in the Retrospection Section Book Club. One board member had lizard skin and yellow eyes and a forked tongue that sprang out of its mouth. That thing makes me feel normal, Tookie thought. She watched the lizard's head turn white and it morphed into an alabaster alligator with pink eyes. Piper smiled. I just know I'm going to be his teacher's pet. So apparently Piper wants to bone this, like, semi-albino lizard teacher. (laughs) Which is really upsetting. I hate it. And then... A stunning figure that looked like it was three-quarters man, one-quarter woman pranced in next, generating a half-hearted smattering of applause. All the board members are called gurus. This guru wore what looked like the mating result of a black leather jumpsuit and a bustier. He, or she, was muscular yet thin, because everyone's thin here, with blonde hair slicked back in a tight ballerina bun. When the figure's eyes connected with girls in the crowd, everyone jumped back a step. Then the guru turned and stared at Tookie and her friends. A sickened expression washed over the guru's face. Blood-curdling seconds pass. Tookie spotted a deep gash on the guru's right cheek, directly under the eye. That's where that one ends. It's basically, she's being horrified by this person who she can't identify her gender. Oh, how horrible! Uh, we find out later that they're, like, a horrible, horrible person. And their name is Gunnero Nars. What? <laughs> Because when I said the names in this book got bad, I was, like, prepping you for the lead-up. Because because it gets bad. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that takes us to, um, the Belladonna appears, but she's made out of stone. Like, she only appears in, like, this kind of, like, visage of any, um, statues of her or stuff like that. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of statues of her around campus, and she just, like, inhabits them when she wants to talk to people. She never appears in person. Yeah, nobody's really ever seen her in real person. So she appears, and then one of the blank-eyed soulless women took five giant measured steps and stood at attention on the left side of the statue. She appeared to be in her mid-40s, and she was one of the mannequin-bodied ones, so she's a mannequin. Who's that? Tuki asked Zhen Zhen. Her name's Persimmon, like the weird fruit, Zhen Zhen replied. She's the Belladonna's chief mannequin. Okay, so it gets horrifying. Like, I'm gonna... She starts to sing, and it sounds like a normal, like, you know, school theme song. It's really long, everybody's singing, and then all of a sudden, CO appears. She's dressed in a sateen couture straight jacket. She rose she rises through the ground of the stage and prison in a bird cage whose bars are made of razors. The Belladonna goes, Regard this renegade, this rowdy rabble rouser, this shameless charlatan, this skank scallywag, a troublemaking malady, a traitor, defective, while we all zig, this pest must zag. CL cast a mournful look at the statue. You've all grown up dreaming, hoping to be here. Now this triple seven seven is inferior to you. So learn from her missteps. Hello to your futures. To CL's au revoir, adios and adieu. Oh, okay, so then they, they go to the arena that's being rebuilt. It's the Orb Arena, where pretty boys and gorgeous girls battle in man attack. Which is... Nobody really knows what that is until it happens. <laughs> and, uh, it's... Oh boy, it's wild. <laughs> it really is. Zhen Zhen warns everybody, uh, I have one last piece of knowledge to share with you. It's about Catwalk Corridor. Technically, I'm not supposed to warn you, but when CL used to get these tours, she always broke a few rules and warned the girls. So beware. Um, you never know where it may appear. It's nothing stinging, antiseptic, and a tetanus shot can't fix, but still it could give you a fright. And uh, she also says it isn't half as bad as the ugly room. Um, and then she just kind of leaves it with that. And then this horrifying little tidbit. Oh god, a gr- so they're going through another zip zap. A girl named Angelica from Icy Land, which is probably Iceland, yapped like an excited Yorkshire Terrier. Yay, 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 isn't this great? She jumped into one of the zip zaps so enthusiastically, she scraped the top of her head on its sharp pull tab. Tookie cringed, seeing bits of blood and hair still hanging from it. <sighs> which, why? What, what the fuck? Tyra! I don't want to know. Tyra Banks is a menace to society. 
Oh, okay. So they find out there's they're gonna do this kind of like、um, initiation thing where、um, they like they weed out the weak, and it's called thigh high boot camp. And so Zarpesa is going into the zipper. This, I had this is the best insult. I had to, I had to say this. Are you ready? Says Zarpesa. Zhen Zhen frowned. What do you mean? Is she ready? Are you ready? No, you heard me right. Zarpesa simpered, her eyes still on Tuki. Are you ready? And then she like dramatically sweeps her hair back and jumps into the zip zap. Tuki could still hear her voice from the inside of the zipper for a lesson on how to shut the hell up. But she like goes down the slide. That's such a good insult for being like a really really bad insult. They all like took the zip zap into this kind of like dark room theater type thing. Oh my god! A girl screamed. The zip zap killed her. The entire group turned to see a girl lying motionless at the mouth of a zipper. Blood pooled beneath her head. Everyone started to scream. <laughs> But it's just the girl. It's just the girl who like scraped her head on the zip zap and left her blood. Yeah, it's Angelica.、Um, okay, so the the one and only evil queer character comes in. Gennaro Nars. And he he tells people.、Uh, oh yeah, we find out it's a he. Because no one can actually be gender queer. No, of course not. Why would you want that? Locate your seats and plop your firm newbie fannies into them," ordered Gennaro. So everybody's going into these seats that are like arranged in a circle,、um, in like these salon-style chairs with their names on them for some reason. I、oh, this is like a really long paragraph. I'm not going to read it, but the only reason I screenshotted it, screenshot it, was because he calls in these this like basket of makeup, and it's describing really, really long、um, like what is in there, but. The one sentence that caught my eye was "false eyelashes made from deceased daddy long legs." Genuine fear. I have so much angst. But yeah, so a bunch of mannequins do their makeup,、yes. uh, make them look really pretty. But and then she mentions that they're all tossing the makeup to each other,、mm-hmm. right? Like the mannequins are doing this elaborately, like choreograph whatever, tossing the makeup across the room and sharing things. <sighs> and then all of a sudden, they look in the mirror. And an older, unrecognizable person was staring at Tuki. It had a boil growing on its nose, laying out smokes that smelled of rotten eggs and animal droppings. Much of its hair had fallen out in clumps, and many of the hanging strands had fused together into what looked like chunks of petrified wood. Its eyes were bruised, swollen, nearly shut, and its ears were swollen into what looked like bulbs of cauliflower. Piper, especially, is really good. Her skin is so raw it was transparent, because remember she's albino, so her blood was visible, pumping through her face. She resembled a skeleton with muscles and veins, with a thin layer of clear plastic keeping it all together. It's just like a bunch of horrifying things. Dylan's nose falls off and is sitting on her hair that had also fallen off. Oh, Angelica, um, her zip zap head injury splits open wide from the top of her head to the base of her neck. When she screamed, her exposed vocal cords, which lay in a spaghetti-like tangle at her throat, vibrated. They find out that. Uh, that's what happens when you share makeup. Yeah, that was a lesson in germs, kids. Don't <clears throat> share makeup, or your nose will fall off. Then they keep going through thigh high boot camp. Basically, horrific things happen, and some of the girls run home, and a giant like sewing machine needle starts coming down from the ceiling, piercing through each girl's skull, continuing、Jeez. through her body to the ground. When the needle retracted, she was gone, and so it does that to each one of them. Just. Sending them off somewhere by sticking a giant needle through one's head because that's normal. That's what you like. Okay, that's like the end of the high boot camp. And then so they like they get ready to go to their classes and stuff and like get their schedules, but they find out that they're、um, all on their periods at the same time. Yeah, literally they wake up and every new Bella started menstruating at the exact same time this morning. Wait, what? You've never heard of menstrual synchrony or the dormitory effect? Piper asked. And then she explains menstrual synchrony. It usually takes months for the alignment to occur, but here at Mawland, it seems to have happened in 24 hours. But I've never gotten my period before this. Tookie whispered. Well, Tookie, looks like you're a woman now. Piper said. <laughs> Because having a period makes you a woman. Yep. Thanks, Tyra. Heteronormativity. Every new girl gets her period at the exact same time, and then they find out. Oh, you'll never have it again after this. But you can still have babies. Because that's what women are for. You can still have babies. But you'll never have your period again because it interferes with your schedule of modeling and doing shows. So they get their schedules,、um, which appear on like an onion skin sheet of paper that comes out of a like perfume atomizer. Everything smells like blood oranges, so of course that smells like blood oranges too. She has a class called Cara Cara Cara. Cara Cara Cara, actually. Okay, I don't know how to speak Spanish. I know this is the one time I shine in this whole class of. <laughs> This whole book of French, and then they have a class called Runaway Intensive, and they have a class called Mastication. On her way to her class, Kara、um, Kara Kara, 
she sees some models from testosterone um, who are sexily working on building the new stadium because the old one burned down in a fire because sometimes the diabolical divide sends fireballs and one happened to land on the old stadium and burned it down and many people died because that's mentioned just offhand like one sentence yeah next page oh um first night Tuki witnesses something horrifying because we find out Tuki sleepwalks and every time she sleepwalks she ends up somewhere horrific yeah, so Tuki sleepwalks into a room where the only thing in there is a photo on the wall of the obscure obelisks. She approaches the door carefully and put her hand on the knob. Suddenly a sharp sound made her stop. Whack, whack, more wax came, followed by whimpers and the muddy sound of breathy, unintelligible words. Heart pounding, Tuki poked her head around the doorframe. Inside was a cinder block room that resembled a jail cell. A figure was on its knees rocking back and forth and mumbling, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault. Over and over and over. The person held a wooden plank in hand, and their back was bruised and bloody. The only item in the room was a picture pinned to the wall. Uh, the three pillars, blah, blah, blah. More chants and deeper moans came from the figure. The deranged person raised the plank once more. No, Tookie said silently. Who could do such a thing to themselves? Whack. A gash in the figure's back opened, and Tookie could see raw flesh. Yeah, so she's, like, clawing at the pictures, uh, and she, like, is hitting her head against the wall and, like, screaming that and she's surprise. sorry. It's CL. It's CL. So she goes to car, car, car class. Hola, hola, hola. I am, oh, wait, no, you have to read this one. You have to read this oh, in your Spanish accent. Okay. So his face is kind of like rubber, and it, it's like constantly morphing into different faces. Hola, hola, hola. I am Guru Pacifico Cruz from the land of Texicoco, he announced. At Model Land, we are not fans of last names, so please call me Guru Pacifico. This, my dear Bellas, is Cara 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 class. Being a Modella Fantastica is all about mastering how to maneuver your face. And speaking of faces, this course will prepare you for what you will face out in the real world, too, if you become Intoxibellas. I'm so mad. What? <laughs> this Spanish accent is so much better than my French accent. <laughs> I, all I did was channel Antonio Banderas. Oh, I hate you, man. <laughs> so, okay, the, the premise of Cara 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 class is... That you're, they show you horrifying pictures, and you're supposed to do the opposite of, like, you're supposed to smile. And they show you, like, really happy pictures, and you're supposed to act disgusted. Like, it's, you're supposed to, like, quell your own emotions and, like, project what emotions that the, you know, it's for the future photographer that's trying to make you, like, project an emotion. A shark bite sound filled the room, and then a three-dimensional image of a two-headed vulture picking at a child's eyes appeared before every Bella. So that's a thing that Ty Tyra Banks came up with in her head. Piper covered her eyes, saying that it looked like a Ligizzard, so apparently a two-headed vulture somehow resembles a Ligizzard. A girl named Bo, who sat on the other side of Tuki and seemed devoid of any expression whatsoever, didn't react at all, so I'm really worried about Bo. Right, who we never see again! So Bo, uh, they're showing all these crazy pictures. The only girl he corrected almost as much was Dead Face Bo, who didn't even freak out over a photo of a dead cat giving birth to an octopus on an abandoned road. Tyra! What? <sighs> so Tuki meets this guy named Bravo who's working on the new stadium because he's a Bastosta bro. And then they have class with Gennaro Nars. They have runaway intensive. You run magically, but it looks like you're walking because of your centura. And I honestly don't want to explain it because it's just so convoluted. I don't it looks like you're walking down the runway, but then when you see what's actually happening behind the scenes, they're like sprinting frantically and like ripping clothes off back. Yeah. There's like magic hands ripping clothes off them. Oh yeah, and CL's in this class. And she turns up in an outfit made of hundreds of copper and brass colored handcuffs. So she has to, uh... She has to participate. Yeah, she has to be the example and show them. It looks like she's walking, but she's really just sprinting. Shiraz is like, why are you, like, why why do you have to lie? Why can't you just walk? And Gennaro's like, my pint-sized Lilliputian. Why does a lady never let a man see her bare face sans makeup? It ruins her glamour, her mystery. It makes her real. So, like, that is makeup propaganda, Tyra. I'm calling you the fuck out. Apparently, people think I'm really real and I have no glamour or mystery because I don't remember the last time I wore makeup <laughs> that wasn't, like, for a play. CL has, like... She was, like, pretty friendly to everybody, like, the four weird girls, um, but now she's taken to, like, glaring at them like she wants to murder them. CL shows up again um, with Persimmon uh, guiding her. The Fallen 777 had a muzzle over her mouth. Her normally caramel-colored skin, there we go again, was pale. She wore a baggy gray jumpsuit with a metal zipper up the front. On the back of the jumpsuit, the words ugly room were scrawled in black letters. Which Tyra has, like, a weird thing with CL in bondage. Yeah. And I say weird because, yeah, CL's being punished, but also 
she's openly said that CL is a self insert or like a reflection of herself as a mom yeah. or whatever. So I'm just like, ah, uh, why bondage? Questions? Why, why bondage at a high school? Like, why are you exposing this? That's my other thing is there, we're not even dealing with adults here. Like yeah. CL. And this is a young like adult young novel. Adults. The Belladonna statue in the room comes to life. And then all of a sudden CL starts puking flowers. <laughs> A oh, yeah. of flowers protruded from CL's lips. Uh, she wrenched the flowers of her mouth, but a large rose bush popped out next. She struggled to remove the bush, uh, trying unsuccessfully to avoid the thorns. Love how she threw that little detail in there that her mouth is just ripped up now. After that, popped out a purple orchid plant, then a mess of daisies and dandelions, then a bunch of springy tulips, then ivy. They meet the chef. Oh boy, I forgot about the chef. Her, sh- her outfit is made out of knives and ladles and then food as well and she's from australia she and then she inspects everybody's tongue she has the power to tell like what they like to eat (laughs) she makes everybody take a dessert shower so they're literally in this room of like food play where there's stuff there's dessert showers coming out of the walls just shooting food including nuts which how do you make a shower head (laughs) big enough for nuts to come out of it it's just a hose a nut hose (laughs) no (laughs) <laughs> Never say those two words together again. What, nut hose? Teenage girls bathing in a nut hose. <laughs> Thanks, Tyra. God, we have strayed so far from what our ancestors would have wanted. <laughs> so they're, they're in there, they're in the cafeteria again, uh, and the, the Bastasta bros come by. Uh, these girls are just freaking out. Sexified succulents, someone cried. I'm going to hyper, hyper, hyper hyperventilate, moaned a girl wearing large sunglasses. I call firsties, exclaimed Chase, and lasties, and tops and bottoms. Um, Then Persimmon comes back and she's going to lead them to another class. And then Chase is like, where are we going? I was just about to flash my breastosteros. Um, Anyway, so then they go to a spa. It's a really weird spa. It's called the Uwa. Because they go, ooh, ah. Then there's this 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 uh, giant space with a large circle painted in the middle of the floor. Three women are in there, um, and their hair is fused into one beehive. And these are the uh, flashback females, and they will be important later. Yeah, so basically they make you see, like, part of your past. Like, you relive moments from your past. And everyone who's in the room also relives it. They don't get a choice. Then Bravo is there, the pistachio bro guy. Tookie's trying to convince herself she's not into him. He has a piece of wood on his shoulder, and a piece of wood falls onto Tookie's lip. His thumb touched both her lips, then entered her mouth just a bit. He removed the last traces of chipped wood, but his thumb lingered between her lips and made slight contact with her tongue. Tookie wanted to bite down on his hand to teach him a lesson, but instead she closed her lips on her thumb, locking it inside her mouth, her body betraying her. She smelled him. So she literally just, like, sucks his thumb into her mouth? I hate it bonus points though go watch the america's next top model episode please about model land because tyra herself plays tookie in this scene yes and there's some like hot model dude being bravo and she literally just goes and, and like like hoovers <laughs> down on it and they play a sound effect very similar to that and it's the funniest thing i've ever seen on reality television <laughs> it's horrible um Oh, okay, okay, so the next one is, we find out, we discover that Creamy and Miracle have undertaken the pilgrimage, and uh, they, they're they going up the Model Land Mountain. Oh yeah, they're braving the diabolical divide. And this, this guy named Macy Kamada is leading them, he's like their tour guide, or tour guide, he's like their guide, um, and a bunch of other people are there too. Including Abigail Good, the yeah, hairy the, girl. Yeah, the hairy girl. And her mom, who's also hairy. Oh boy. Um, so we find out that they're going to go up there because Creamy is like, you made the wrong choice. Miracle deserved to be there, not Tookie. Um, okay, so then they're in War of Words class. And then Ciel is also there and she she and Tookie are facing off about uh, the whether, you know, a narrow definition of beauty is is like the good, like what they should instill or um, whether beauty is an eye of the beholder. So Tookie basically tells Ciel like a letter... As though she were writing in T-mail jail. And she tells CL, When you chose me on the day of discovery, you were my savior. I think you're deeply troubled, perhaps even mentally ill. <coughs> Which, nice. Yeah. And then she says, Zarpessa says she has no idea why my friends and I are here at Mawland. It's not like I have a clue either. I know people here see a midget and a whale and a ghost and a freak of nature. Jeez, girl. Yeah, Jesus. Just like drag your friends. <gasps> right. 
So she goes on and on and on, and then Ciel is like, they've brainwashed you, they lobotomized you, and then she says, beauty can be this, and she points to one girl, or this, and she points to another girl, or that, or that, or it can be, and then Dylan screams, fat! <laughs> and then she has like a mental breakdown. Fat! <laughs> she breaks down and she talks about how she's always felt fat, everybody's always made fun of her, and you know, like, why am I even here? Because I'm fat, I don't belong. Yeah, everyone else here has something in common except for me. You have different features, but you're all skinny, basically. And so she leaves the class, she storms out, and then she kind of, like, has a breakdown. And then, so they're all in the bathroom while Dylan Dylan has, I guess, thrown up. And they're all in the bathroom covered in her vomit. Oh, and then, so another thing that's never mentioned again, I labeled this one, My Mental Health is Worse Than Yours, because they're all having a heart-to-heart. Toki brings out her diary and reads this entry about how she wants to die and how she hopes i hope you go to sleep tonight and don't wake up oh how beautiful the world will be tomorrow with you dead and then everybody's like oh i feel so guilty i've had issues but i never wanted to be dead and then toki's basically like yeah i have the worst out of all of us because i am suicidal which is never mentioned again or before yeah she just wrote a self-paying letter to herself, reads it to them, and then... They start to pity her, too. Yeah, so they all have a pity party in the bathroom and then decide, you know, look, we're all special, we're all wonderful, and we should fight to be here. Yeah, and so they decide to call themselves the Unicas. No, Unicas. Oh, I thought it was... She oh, gives okay. a pronunciation in here, too. Oh, shit, They're you're the right. the Unicas. The Unicas. That's Because I hate it. It looks like it should be Unica's. We all go back to the pilgrims. We find out that they're uh, they're in terrible shape. They lost weight. Their clothes are hanging off their bodies. The bones of their spines are jutting out. They walk stiffly. Their muscles are broken down. <laughs> they find uh, a pond and they're like, oh man, we can finally bathe. Um, and then a wave of bubbles swept across the pond. Things began to rise to the surface. Skulls. Thousands of them. Um, they bobbed in the water. This girl named Jessamine is in there. Uh, Abigail and her mother Harriet scampered ashore. Oh, there's a guy named Hunchy. <laughs> oh, I forgot! I forgot about Hunchy! I think he's, like, implied to be a Legizard. I'm not sure if it's stated. He wants to go up Mountain Land because he specifically knows that Piper is up there and wants to eat her organs. So I think he really is a Legizard. So he is braving the diabolical divide to go eat this one random girl's pancreas. And they call him Hunchy because he didn't have a name, but he has a hunchback. So of course his name is naturally Hunchy. Way to go, Tyra! Oh, okay, so um, Jessamine is in the water. Something rose from the water, taking Jessamine's mother's breath away. A muck-covered creature as tall as a giraffe. Its body was made of dozens and dozens of human arms, and its head was a mash of ancient musical instruments contorted into an evil, hungry-looking array of sharpened, sideways-turned cymbals for teeth, hollow eyes made of tuba bells, and a steaming nose made of organ pipes. She tried to paddle away, but the monster scooped her up and took a large bite out of her torso, carefully avoiding her arms. So yeah, Jessamine gets murdered by this music monster. And then it sticks its arms on with the rest of the arms on its body. And I think her mom gets eaten too, trying to save her, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they both yeah. get bitten in half. Um, okay, so, oh god, Jesus fucking Christ. So they leave the Ua or whatever, or wherever the fuck they are. Yeah, so now we're back to Monoland. And they're in, they, they accidentally stumble upon Catwalk Corridor. Which has, like, no clear entrance. It's just like, you happen to be there. It's where um, Intoxabellas, who have, like, stepped out of line, go. They get they get turned into cats with human faces. So if you've seen what we do in the shadows, <laughs> yes. you know exactly what they look like. <laughs> yeah. He could turn into all sorts of animals, but now he never gets the faces right. Because they're catty. That's why they get sent to Catwalk Corridor. Yeah, they're catty, and they do drugs. One of the cats bites Tookie. Um, Watch out, Della Creme, says one of the cats. This kitty cat got a taste of your sweetness and wants more of your cream. Which is Which, terrifying. That's a really upsetting thing to say. I, I especially really, to a 15 year old. Really hate that so much. I'm sure it wasn't meant to have sexual connotations, but boy, if it doesn't. It really does. Uh, so they escape by going into the Belladonna statue's lion's mouth, and then they leave. Um, they discover that there is a secret zip zap inside of the old stadium that burned down, but so many girls died using the emergency exit trying to get to Ladorno um, when the stadium burned up. So you're not supposed to go there. Oh, yeah. Piper, Piper is taking Tookie to the um, the nurse. Yeah, because her face got cut by a cat. And all of the cats in the Kawa corridor have tetanus on their claws for some reason. They go to the fashion emergency department. Then they go to the checking counter. A woman who looked about 150 years old sat behind the desk. 
She wore an elaborate sage green cape made of multiple types of pistols, knives, nooses, and razors with a hat shaped like a pair of angry scissors. I don't know how a cape can be made of those <laughs> objects. Like, I like to imagine it's like the nooses stringing all of them together like macrame style. Yeah, that's exactly what I picture. <laughs> then she goes, excuse me, ma'am. The woman's old eyes bulged. Ma'am? You call me ma'am? Oh, no. You should never call me that. My name is Purse Dressed to Kill. Oh, yeah, and they're not nurses. They're purses because everything has to be an awful fashion pun. The doctor comes in. She's dressed really oddly. She has uh, sponges and uh, her hair is made out of a mop. And then Chucky's like, oh, I get it. She's wearing cleaning supplies. Scrubs. Scrubs. And she turns out to be this woman named Dr. Erica. The one normal name in this book. This girl named Desperata's there. Desperata is always crying, and it turns out because she has um, boy withdrawals. Yeah, that's literally what the doctor diagnoses her with. Tuki notices that the woman has rollerblades for feet, and she asks, where'd you get your skates? And this concept is never, ever mentioned again. She realizes that her skates are attached to her body, the same color and texture as skin, which is horrifying. But then she's like, why are there so many uh, different looking gurus around here? And then Erica starts to explain, that's because hundreds of years ago, Madeline took us all in. The doctor explained her hands moving quickly over Tuki's sliced ankle and then her lips. Anyone born different, we would be locked up and tested on without this place. If it weren't for Madeline, my kind and others like me would be freaks. Like her, she said, referring to purse dressed to kill, who passed by in the corridor outside. All I'll say is that, uh, that's not a hat. So she literally just has scissors come out of her head. It was a blessing for my kind because the powers that be at Model Land recognized that skates for feet would be put to good use in emergency medical situations, the doctor continued. They figured we could get from one patient to the next with speed and ease. So they trained all of us and here I am. They take good care of us. My daughter, Kamina Marsh, uh, she's about your age. She's just like her mama got roller skates for feet too. She wouldn't stand a chance in life without this place. She's in medical school right now. So Model Land isn't just what you see. She explains that there's like an underground to Model Land, which is never mentioned. How are you just born with roller skates for feet? Yeah, I want to know the backstory. Like, the world building actually, like, low, like has some very low-key, like, very base potential. Like, I'm interested to like, know what how caused... how does that just Yeah, happen? like, what caused all the monsters? What caused all these mutations? I want to know, but Tyra will never tell us. Because we need to worry about being models. Um, Bravo shows up and is like, uh, I needed to have my thumb sucked. Yeah, and they flirt really painfully. He brings her snacks. Yeah, Zarpessa shows up. Tuki sucks his thumb again with some bloody saliva. Zarpessa says, Tutu just mouth pee peed all <laughs> over you. <laughs> Bravo says that he wants to be Tuki's first time. And she's like, what the fuck? Which is my reaction. But then he says, oh, I meant, yeah. I meant your first kiss. Which is uh, significantly better. Yeah, thank God. Then he's like, I want you to be my lady, which is... Bleh. And then she says, I can't wait to lose my lip virginity to you. Which is terrifying again. Yeah. Okay, so then we go back to the pilgrims. Yes, they have made weapons out of random things. A couple creatures known as the Tumble Terrors blew in with them, which we'll get to that in a second. Abigail Goods, the hairy girl, her legs had been deeply gashed by the unseen critters. One of the pug-sized creatures had extracted a three-inch chunk from Abigail's mother's shaggy buttocks. Like, Tyra is so obsessed with emphasizing their hair. It bites off somebody's middle finger, uh, and then Creamy and Miracle are the only ones that are uh, being calm. Creamy had packed her own special concoction made of insect repellent, paint remover, and turpentine, so that she sprays them on their limbs and it repels the tumble terrors yeah i don't know if that's safe to put on your skin but it's all right definitely not and creamy reveals that you know everybody's like how do you know this and she's like from personal research um which is vague and whatever hunchy expertly spears a tumble terror and hurls it to the ground then he takes off its boot revealing razor sharp sharp claws lifted a foot and slice the creature's human torso so the tumble terrors are tiny people that are the size of pugs, but yelped in a deep, human-sounding voice. Hunchy reached into the fresh gap in the torso, sifted through various organs that were still operating, and pulled out the pancreas. He then placed the entire bloody organ in his mouth. The sweetbreads he desired were so close, yet so far, within a certain pale-skinned Unica who re resided in Model Land. So he literally, that just jumped, we just perspective jumped into Hunchy's head. While everybody's sleeping, these things called flute creepers, uh, they they anesthetize them with their flute sleeper venom and then crawl into their windpipes and they digest their victims slowly over a period of weeks, working from the body's deepest interiors to the exteriors, all while the victims remained alive but paralyzed, feeling every bit of the pain. Tyra, hey, Tyra. thanks. 
What, what the, the hell? Fuck? Kamada, the guide, was supposed to stay awake at night because that's like how you protect yourself from them is have someone keep watch. But he fell asleep. And so Miracle, do we let them die, Creamy? Miracle said calmly, peering at the knocked out pilgrims. There's strength in numbers, Miracle, dear. We need them for later, Creamy said, walking up to the group. The mountain needs them for later, she added under her breath. Miracle is just broken at this point. She's like 13 and she's yeah. just calmly watching people. Do we let them die, Mom? Miracle got the short end of the stick. So she she has to cut out the red metallic heart of the flute creeper and feed them to the victim. Oh, yeah, it's because it's anti-venom. Yeah, and then this is how they're like, how do you know how to do this? And then she's like, personal research. Primal scream rang out, but it wasn't coming from the tombstone. That's me reading this book. <laughs> Same, a primal scream. Then she, So Abigail begins screaming at the mountain about how, like, oh, I thought I could change the world and show them how beautiful a hairy body can be, um, but I've had enough. And she begins to, she picks up a shiny metal thing. Everybody thinks she's going to kill herself. But then instead of killing herself, she actually just starts shaving her entire body. She strips <laughs> naked in front of everyone. <laughs> and and then just, just shaves. Shaves her whole body. With a dagger. With a dagger. With lightning speed. She, <laughs> Abigail shaved her sideburns, her arms, her most private of parts, and then her legs. She finished by removing all the knee-length back hair from her head. Every trace of her hair, eyebrows included, was gone and lay in clumps at her feet. Oh, God. Oh, and then so once she's shaved, you know, because hair is horrible, they discover, oh my gosh, she's actually the most beautiful girl we've ever seen. If only she hadn't had all that hair. Pretty, Hunchy slobbered, ogling Abigail. The organ eater was wrong, though. Abigail was not simply pretty. She was out of this world, breathtakingly beautiful, absolutely, undeniably, soul-stirringly stunning. Kamada smiled at her for the first time since the journey had begun. Creamy's expression, however, was the polar opposite of those of the rest of the crew. With Jessamine out of the way, Miracle had become the most stunning girl in the group, but now, with countless flicks of a makeshift braver, that was no longer the case. Creamy shot Abigail a jealous look of death. She got naked and shaved everything, and she is the hottest girl you've ever seen in your life. Um, so they hear the sound of feet flitting towards them, and then... Flitting is really a word I wouldn't associate with the horror coming on this next page. The source of the noise appeared. It was a spider-like creature three times the size of the Peppertown City bus. But instead of eight legs, this creature had thousands, and the legs looked human. They stuck out of the creature's body like the spikes of a porcupine. With the monster reared up, it revealed a soft, fleshy underbelly. Ah, uh, yes, the glowing boss target. <laughs> There was an immense leech's sucker in the middle. Tiny but numerous sharp toenail-shaped teeth rimmed the opening. And then it's, they decide it's called a leg leech. Yeah, so it bites um, hot Abigail and her mother in half and they die. That's what they get. There's no redemption if you're hairy. Nope. If you don't shave every single day, you will be eaten by a thousand-legged spider. I really want to meet Tyra, but like know in advance that I'm meeting her so I can just not shave my legs for like six months. <laughs> And then wear, like, a short dress to meet her. Yeah, and then just, she'll just, her soul will depart her body. Exactly! She'll be like, oh! And isn't that what we all deserve? Yes, after all that she's put us through. Back to it! Tuki uh, sleepwalks into the M, which is, like, the um, office building where all the, like, administration takes place, and allegedly where the Belladonna's office is. She sees CL talking to a statue of the Belladonna. Uh, the knowledge I have will make you do whatever the hell I want, because if you don't, I will tell everyone your little secret. And what secret is that? The Belladonna asked in a voice that was nervously subdued. You made one grave mistake, CL said, and I don't mean torturing me for half a friggin' year, or making me redo War of Words in my first year uniform, or demanding I answer calls at the modeling agency where I've had to tell clients CL is not available to model for you because she's an ingrate, or forcing me to clean the floors of the ugly room with my tongue, or gagging me like a horse while you pry my eyes open and make me watch old model and propaganda films for seven hours at a time so that you drip sailing in my eyes so they don't dry out, or denying me food for three days in a row to slim my thick hips, or making me feel so crazy and deranged that I had to freeze my face into a half-pleasant expression to hide the agonizing pain my body is truly suffering from every day. All right, Nebula. Until he knows some semblance of the profound and unceasing pain I know every single day. Yeah, right? So then CL is like, uh, no, you made the mistake of insisting I work in the admissions department where I have full access to the new Bella's admission records. Do you want to know what I saw? Before we go there, let's go over the three most important rules that each Belladonna must abide by. You must set a world-changing definition, de definition of beauty and stick to it. Uh, two, all gurus must have a combination of a defect and a power. Uh, last but not least, three, do not tamper with the predetermined admissions list. And then Toki's like, oh, it's predetermined, it's all a hoax, whatever. And then the Belladonna's like, oh, I'm gonna get you, the ugly room would be just the beginning. 
And then she's like, you're not going to abolish those girls, meaning Shiraz, Piper, and Dylan. I want them. Why? The Belladonna's voice was laced with something that almost sounded like fear. See, I'll laugh devilishly, almost evilly. You know why. They're my experiments. If you don't let me, what I did to those girls' bodies just might have to happen again. This time, I'll be successful. Let the death march begin. Come on, belly Donna, you're up for a little sacrifice, aren't you? Oh, also, Gennaro Nars has been calling CL body girl this whole time. Right, and that- And we didn't know why. Yeah, so we know she did something to some girls' bodies. Which, it turns out to be literally, like, it's horrifying, but, like, it's it's not horrifying enough, if that makes sense. Like, it- It's actually not horrifying in context, yeah, really. Yeah, I was expecting this, like, big, scary reveal, like, holy shit, she really, like- messed with the laws of nature but no i know i was thinking like what do they have to like cannibalize someone before they can yeah transform into them with their their chameleon power but no it's nothing like that it's not even remotely as horrifying as it should no be. and i mean even like my level down from what you were talking about my expectation was like oh she like did some like unwilling plastic surgery or like brought somebody back from the dead or something like that like you know oh yeah that's true like body girl okay you did some weird like body mods but no Okay, so then she she goes and is talking to Bravo about something. In her dorm room. In her though. dorm room, right. She's in her dorm room and men are not supposed to be in there. She's about to tell Bravo about her, she and her friends plan to escape. What in the hell is the Bestastro doing in here? A voice boomed through the door, interrupting them. Suddenly, Ciel appeared. The Unicas tumbled in after her. Ciel's eyes were on Bravo and her face was bright red. Get out, she screamed at him. Then she glared at Tuki. Do you know what happens to girls like you who break the rules? Do you know how much I want to kill you right now? Ciel raised her arms in the air and fabric covered in fire shot from her fingertips. Everyone screamed. Uh, she's walking towards them. Her shape is shifting and twisting with the power of Chameleone. Um, her skin is melting, her tendons are popping, her eyes are blazing red, steam is puffing from her nostrils. Uh, she's got sharpened teeth and she's got claws. Tuki's like, this is kind of how we're going to die. And then Persimmon comes in and is like, what the fuck are you doing? She doesn't say fuck. <laughs> Just, dr- okay, if one person in this book got one, I'd probably give it to Persimmon, honestly. Oh, she deserves it. Yeah, not in this scene, but later, and there's a reason why. Yeah. Seal's shaking her finger as Persimmon is dragging her away, and her nails are like long and pointy talons. I should just burn you alive, she hissed. <laughs> that night, Toki goes back to her room, um, and she has a horrifying dream about Ciel coughing out a malicious laugh as blood squirts from her eyes, her friends rotting dead bodies, and then an alarm goes off, and it turns out that the girl Desperado is trying to escape. Oh, yeah. Because she has to go see her boyfriend. And then she crawls over the wall, and we the wall turns see-through, and we see that uh, her she's aging rapidly, and like she still has the body of like a 14-year-old, but her face has become like hideously wrinkled and old, and there's so many wrinkles. Mm. Gee, who does that sound like? Hint, hint. Bravo is explaining man attack. It's like the Hunger Games mixed with the, like, athletic uh, showcase from My Hero Academia. But it's them, like, competing. It's like Modeland and Bestosterone competing to see, like, who's the most fashionable. First one is like, oh, okay, you have to assemble an outfit that's on your theme. Second is you have to do makeup. And it's anti-gravity, yeah. um, the clothes are shooting out, they have to assemble an outfit, there's little, like, makeup bombs that you, like, you throw, they're like little grenades. But there's body oil in them for the men, because men don't wear makeup. Right, mm -mm, no, not allowed. It's not manly. Oh my god, this is so much. Everything is happening so much. So Bravo, okay, so Bravo's explaining, and then Tookie's like, please, 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 I just need to tell you something. I need to tell you- Oh yeah, she's trying to tell him that they're gonna escape, because he told her about the secret exit. There's a secret exit under this new uh, stadium that they just built. But he keeps, like, brushing her off and talking anyway. He because he's a man. No offense. Full offense. Okay. Then he's hugging her, and then she finally tells him, and then he's like, my only, you know, I only wanted to date you because it was a bet between my friends to see if I could get the ugly girl to fall for me, and she's like, oh! and then she explains what her perfect kiss would be like. And it's really it's weird. It's really fucking weird. Do we want to read it? The lucky guy who will get to pucker with my suckers. Oh, God. That's all I want to read. Yeah, I don't... I don't want to go through the rest of this. Basically, it's really weird and complicated. Oh, no, but part of it is also he sprays whipped cream in straight into my mouth and then his. And they'll part his mouth just a little and press his lips against mine. <laughs> so basically, she wants to just, like, whipped cream bird feed each other during <laughs> their first kiss. Ew! No! Which I couldn't leave out because that horrifies me. I hate me. it! But yeah, so they're playing against each other in man attack and like she's like screaming this at him the whole time they're like putting on clothes yeah so they're competing against each other and they're yeah while all this is happening like afterwards 
they're at the wall and uh, the top of a muddy head appears and this like bulbous demonic cruddy person comes over and then pipe i love that she uses the word cruddy <laughs> same i love it like some of her other descriptors are so vividly horrifying and then she just says cruddy, cruddy. and i'm just like all right it sees the, the girls the unicas and a growl em- emits from the deaths of his ballet piper is like it's a legizzard they killed my father and now this one's come for me it wants to eat my pancreas and uh cl's like what the fuck and it had a gnarled hunched back and you're supposed to think it's hunchy but it's creamy oh yeah oh yeah and uh, the reason why they're all charred the reason why they're all oh. charred, we skipped it, is because earlier the remaining pilgrims got hit by, like, giant fireballs. Yes! And one hunched creature got up and, like, scampered away afterwards, so we're supposed to think everyone died except for Hunchy. And then you find out, nope, Creamy made it! She somehow survived a fireball directly to the face. And Miracle also made it, but you, it's not, like, that's not important. Oh yeah, important. she turns up in, like, a minute. <laughs> they leave Model Land, um, and they go on this kind of, like, crazy bus chase away from CL. Yeah, okay, so they find Lizzie. Uh, Lizzie is like, I knew you wouldn't leave me, but, you know, I'm here, and and then sh- she disappears, and then um, they're at the obscure obelisk. And, s- and she just, like, picks up sharp rocks off the ground and starts cutting yeah, her wrist. Yeah, she literally, like, oh my god, it makes me so fucking mad. She's literally just, like, grabs a rock off the ground and slices her wrist, Jesus. because that's how self- harm works apparently tyra needs like to chill she needs a lesson in like trauma informed writing like ah! and then like lizzie like runs out in front of the bus or something i think yeah i don't and they like crash they like swerve and crash and uh do we ever see lizzie no again after that's that? the last time we do. see her she's like it's implied that she's alive yeah so they, they end up at the obscure obelisks and uh cl explains that she p- erected the obelisks because <laughs> she put up the obelisks Don't. because um they are they're like effigies in remembrance of her old friends that died because when she got selected for model land um her friends who mysteriously resemble Shiraz Piper and Dylan even though they're that's never explained like they just have a rem- like a resemblance that's that's it my thought was that CL resurrected them and Dylan Shiraz and Piper are them yeah. But that's not what happened. They just, but they no. literally just look like them. Anyway, so uh, she got selected to, to model land and her friends that she had grown up with all her life and she was in like an orphanage, they wanted to go with her. So they, they went up the, the mountain to like on the pilgrimage and they died. And so she found out and dug up their bodies. And that's why everybody calls her body girl. And that's why she, her life is terrible is because, oh, my friends. Yeah, she dug up their bodies and buried them like in the square yeah, under, the, under obelisk, the obelisk and she built the obelisk with her magic powers and so the sh- there's a short a short obelisk for her short friend and a fat obelisk for a fat friend and a tall white obelisk for her albino friend yeah and so like this is this is the point where i was like okay this is this is a little too I'm, like, genuinely afraid of the things inside Tyra's brain. But just wait. Just wait. We're not even at the plot twist No, yet. we're not. Everything's fine. CL is like, okay, I, you know, I'm sorry I was so mean to you guys. You just remind me of my friends so much. And Tookie makes her promise that, oh, we'll go back to Mall Land with you if you stop hurting yourself. Yeah. And then CL is, is like, Tuki, you're on your own. I'm so sorry, but I'm feeling the urge to go find a read. Like, be- flatulate be- herself. joking about self-harm is hilarious That's so funny wow tyra banks really really woke here uh so finally they go back to model land in the zip up um and they end up in the ua which is the spa they go there because creamy insists on talking to the belladonna in person right yes the weird omniscient narrator returns again and is like oh you thought it was over ha uh-huh, bitch <laughs> just kidding i got it Bloop. <laughs> 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 and then She's like, okay, uh, the next thing that's going to happen is the 7-7 tournament or whatever, the the anointment ceremony. Yeah, where they decide who is going to be this year's seven in Toxabellas. Yeah. Oh, my poor dear darling. You thought it was over, didn't you? The, the Unicas piled into Miss used to be sweet, then turned crazy, <laughs> and now is sweet again in Toxabella's pouchlet and sailed up, up, up into the sunset, the end. Darling, you should be ashamed of yourself. There's so much more to this story to tattle tell you. And how dare you assume otherwise? It was quite the shocker that CL was not a murderous sociopath, wasn't it, darling? Might I suggest the next time you come across another vindictive, vile, venomous creature, you stop, drop, and roll around the idea that maybe the, shall I say, bitch did not spring out of her mother's birth canal that way. (laughs) 
I can money back guarantee that her sorrowful sourpuss saga would be quite interesting, but nowhere near as juicy as this one. I don't want a juicy saga. I want this to go away. Everyone jumped back. Miracle screamed. Tuki clapped her hand over her mouth because... Oh yeah, there's a statue of the Belladonna and it starts breaking. Yeah, and then Dylan says, oh, you broke it. Uh, and as we say in the Boo Big Teak Nation, you boo break it, you boo buy it, baby. <laughs> I hate that so much. Me too. So then the Belladonna literally like claws her way out of the statue because that makes sense. Apparently, she was doing like hard mode mud bath. <laughs> <laughs> hard mode mud bath. <laughs> like you gotta fight your way out of the mud. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> chapter 42. <laughs> okay, ooh, all the Unicas said at once. Boo, the Belladonna answered like a seductive ghost. <laughs> <laughs> God, I didn't screenshot any of this flashback because I'm just going to explain it in like the shortest terms that I can. It's There's no really like great f- like passages. It's just the content itself yeah. is so It's insane. so bad. Okay, so really fast explanation. The flashback females in the Uwa spa basically show everybody flashbacks about how the belladonna whose name was ladonna and um creamy whose name was cremolata defecate <laughs> <laughs> i genuinely i hate it i hate creamy but honestly if my name was cremolata defecate i'd probably pick creamy too okay so ladonna is the belladonna creamy is cremolata defecate and then persimmon who they called percy uh, were all at model land together when they were young then percy persimmon locks the main bathroom door Ran the last stall and peered under it. There was a pair of knees on the floor. Someone was throwing up. I think it's that chicken you chowed in the E, LaDonna, Percy whispered through the door. You'll feel better soon. Why don't you try singing? That always cures your aches and pains. The girl on the other side of the stall just groaned again. Then the knees fr- rose from the ground and the girl slumped onto the toilet. Tookie could practically feel her pain. She had a similar reaction to her chocolate binge, which was why she couldn't have even the tiniest taste of this stuff anymore. After a moment, there was a large splash in the porcelain. Suddenly a small piercing cry rang out. But it wasn't the sickened cry of a young woman wrecked from tainted food. It was the cry of a tiny baby emerging into the world. She literally gives birth into a toilet. But it gets weirder. So CL's like, what the fuck? And then the, like, LaDonna, the Belladonna now, this is still in the past. Her mom, the Queen Belladonna, shows up and she says, LaDonna, are you in there? It's the Queen Belladonna. Your mother, open up. Percy goes into the bathroom and she gets the the baby um, and wraps it in her centura. And then the mom comes in. She's like, give LaDonna's child to me. And then LaDonna cowers behind Percy. But mother, how did you know I was... Even I didn't know. I just thought I was sick. We don't get periods here. So how did you know? I didn't even show. A mother always knows. Right. And that's her explanation. And then she's like, what are you going to do with my baby? And she's like, I'll give it to its father. And then she's like, Percy, you're banished. And she's like, don't make me go home. I can't go back to that cult of persecution. Yeah, P-E-R-S-E-Q-U-E. S-H-U-N. She's literally from a cult called Persecution. Um, and then the Belladonna is like, well, there's no other option if you, you either go home or you become a mannequant. And so she gets turned into a mannequant. This is why Persimmon has the right to say what the fuck. She gets wronged more than anyone else in this she entire really book. She really is. Okay, so kind of like flashes forward. Queen Belladonna gives the baby to the boyfriend. She delivers the baby in a basket. Gracefully, he picks up, picks it up, and uh, does that. He's like about to do a handstand, and then Tookie's like, "Oh my god, is it Chris Krem Krabat?" Yeah, and you're like, "Oh shit!" The Tookie is the is uh, the Belladonna's child. Oh, okay, this makes sense. Like, but no, but no, he literally is like, "Wait a minute, the baby was cradled in a shoe, and she knew that shoe. The Belladonna's boyfriend, the father of the child, wasn't Chris Krem Krabat. He was." wingtip which is literally a random homeless dude that she had a conversation for for like one page back at the very beginning of the book and it's like supposed to be this huge twist and i died it's like if you weren't paying attention you have no idea who wingtip is he hasn't been he might have been mentioned again once when she thought about something he said because she had like an insightful conversation with a homeless man she also missed the flashback where uh oh they sneak out of model land so uh, LaDonna wants to see her child, and so she and Creamy sneak out of Mall Land, and they go over the gate, and they get old, like that one girl did, but LaDonna's like, don't worry, my mom's the Belladonna, she has magic powers and can change us back and make us not old anymore. They go and see the dude, and then LaDonna goes out to go get formula or something, and Creamy immediately, like, Two seconds later, starts seducing him. <laughs> Trying to. But then LaDonna walks back in. It does that stupid, stupid trope of, 
I hate you forever. I immediately believe my best friend, who, even though she was on top of you, insists that you're the one who brought it all yeah. on. And so I hate the love of my life forever. And I never want to see him or my child ever again. They go back to Mawland. The, the Queen Belladonna is super, super mad that they left. She makes LaDonna young again, but not creamy. Yeah, so that's how she got her, like, really crazy wrinkled face. It's so, like the one thing that is foreshadowed in this book is creamy. Jesus. Then we're back in the present. We're done with all their flashbacks. Yes. So Creamy is screaming. She lunges at the Belladonna. There's a scream. Um, droplets of something wet lands on Tookie's cheek. Uh, Creamy and the Belladonna huddled together for a moment as they locked in an intimate embrace. But then Tookie saw sharp, shiny metal objects piercing through her mother's gut and protruding clear through her back. The two women were skewered together with a spike from the Belladonna's dress. Back together again, Persimmon muttered from the sidelines. Honestly, she she gets that line. <laughs> yeah, I'll give that to her. That's not even too snarky. Yeah, okay, so Creamy just got skewered. But she's fine. It's literally like, it didn't hit any major organs. <laughs> the Belladonna gets, like, arrested, basically, yeah. for skewering Creamy. And so there's no Belladonna, so we can't have the 7-7 festival and find out who the new Intoxabellas are. And the world literally collapses. Hospitals are flooded with victims who fainted from the hideous blow. Fashion designers fell into debilitating depression, shocked that they would be given no new muses for inspiration. Some abandoned their showrooms. Others hurled themselves off their tall buildings in Ladorno, their bodies crashing to the street in front of tourists and children. <laughs> That's what you call a fashion disaster. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> too soon dude it's been seven years not getting seven new models is literally enough to implode the entire world economy because fashion designers have no work which again brings me to my question of how does this world function yeah you don't base an economy off of fashion okay anyway that brings us back so Creamy's, like, attached to a hospital bed, but she's, like, in the ugly room. The Belladonna's also there. Um, CL goes to see her with Tuki, and um, the most vomit-inducing sentence is spoken. The Belladonna's, like, repenting for all of her, like, horrible behavior, and, like, I should never have treated you like that. I mean, like, legit, she tortured her child really horribly. Like, she deserves to go to prison. And knowing it was her child, too. Yeah. Because she named her. And this is what she named her. She's like, I see love. That's how I named you. C-L. See love. And I threw up in my mouth. Because it's literally C-I tilde L, and somehow that means see love. But yeah, she named her child this incredibly ridiculously unique name. And then knowing that it was her child, still, like, tortured her. But then C-L's, like, forgiving her. She's like, I know, I was just in a bad place. I tended to torture when I was in a bad place. And then CL's like, it's okay, like, I love you. And then, so everything's fine. You can reconcile with your abusive she's parent. Your mom. Yeah, like, oh, you, you know, that's the message that, oh, even if your parents are super abusive, you still owe your life to them. So you, you better forgive them. Gennaro Nars comes and takes CL away because they're going to execute her. Tookie follows them into the administration building, and literally she's not supposed to be there, but no one notices her because she's so unnoticeable. And so literally she just walks in after them to this like super secret execution somehow. The, there's guards and P CL is like, please just hurry up and do it. Like she just wants to be over. It's just at this point, that's kind of fair. <laughs> This book has been nothing but CL suffering. The diamond blade glimmered in the light, blinding Tukey, just like her mother's mirror had blinded Chris Krim Krabat on the tightrope many years before. Because <laughs> we can't forget about Chris Krim Krabat. God, I wish I could forget about Chris Krim Krabat. She squinted for a moment, watching the blurry guillotine rushing towards CL's neck. Just as the blade reached it, red liquid gushed from CL's neck, covering her body. Then an object appeared on CL's head, a fashionable off-kilter crown. The red liquid transformed into fabric, a stately red damask cape. All at once, the other board members began to applaud to the new Belladonna. Like, what the fuck? Why would you do that to somebody? Literally, she they try to guillotine her and she just grows a crown and a cape and becomes a queen. Which... Usually royalty is the ones getting guillotines, so I don't know why that stops them. Accurate. <laughs> and then she's like, oh, is this a joke? Unfortunately, no, body girl, Nars growled. You are the Belladonna's daughter. You are technically royalty, Guru Applause said. And as you know, the mantle of La Belladonna passes from one member of La Famille Royale to the next. You, CL, are the only living heir. Once your Bella lineage was verified, we summoned you here. It was almost unanimous, it said, I and Gennaro, but my extra hand in the air got us the votes we needed. So wait a second. His head counts as an extra hand for voting? <laughs> That's freaking unfair! Also, this, like, they can't use gender-neutral language for Gennaro, but they can call Guru Aplaze an it? 
Yeah, that's true. I that didn't even notice that. Is fucked up. Anyway, uh, so she accepts the mantle of queen. Royalty always prevails. I flip the bird to democracy. <laughs> So then Bravo comes back and is, like, trying to apologize. He's like, this was never a bet. Here, have my shirtless friends. They all have things painted on their, out on their, like, chest that, like, say, I'm so sorry, it was never a bet. Which is totally normal to have your friends painted chests. Oh, yeah, because this is all from her first kiss thing. Yeah. That she was yelling at him during May Attack, where she wants the guy to sing to her yeah. and dance for her. And have a giant message written on his chest. And then he's like, I want to be your first, your special first. And then uh, they kiss. And then here's the description of this ridiculous first kiss. And then Bravo kissed her forehead, then her cheeks, and then her nose. He sucked on her earlobe, sending a jolt of warmth all over her body, followed by an intense feeling of pleasure she'd never experienced before. Her back arched his slightest touch. Tingles danced from the crown of her head down to her abdomen. She clenched her muscles, then let go. Her explicit jolts of pleasure. Yeah, that was pretty graphic. And then he tells her to close her eyes. She does. Here's a whipped cream can shaking. Instinctively opens her mouth. He puts whipped cream in her mouth. Then he puts it in his mouth. And then they kiss. His lips parted and she felt something thick and slimy inside of her mouth. His tongue. And then she's like, I don't like kissing that way. But you've never kissed before. And she's just like, yeah, but I guess I don't like that. And oh so they just have their weird whipped cream makeout without tongue, which is moderately less weird, I guess. I guess. But if you're going to have whipped cream in your mouth, like, and you don't use tongue, you're just Shh. holding the whipped cream in your mouth and just, like, mooshing your face don't against each other. Don't think about it too much. Oh, and then we get this wonderful ending where Tookie's standing on top of the M building, looking over Metopia. All of a something, some, all of a sudden, something ironic occurred to her. The adjective form of the word Metopia was metopic. Which meant, is she found in Dr. Erica's medical dictionary, of or pertaining to the forehead. It's wonderful I wasn't the queen of Metopia. Because of course. And so basically, it ends with everyone still kind of freaking out because they don't have new 7-7s, seven but whatever. CL is queen, and she asks Tookie, like, hey, so are you ready for your next year here, your second year? And Tookie's just like, boy, howdy, I am. She sold her soul to the smize. And pretty much that's the end, is it just ends on, like them standing on this rooftop and being like yep we're gonna have a great second year at model land horrific things didn't happen here at all ye gods smite tyra banks that's like why the reviews said like the depressing consumerist end like that's exactly what it is it just skips all of the consequences and it's just like but tookie's happy here now this book is on another plane of existence that we don't have access to yet it's literally like proof of ancient aliens visiting (laughs) Is like Tyra tapped into the alien consciousness and was like, a guy with a head hand. But yeah, so I think we should end with a recommendation. Yeah. Because uh, I personally recommend this book if you go into it with your loins girded. Gird your fucking loins. If you prepare yourself and you know that it's going to be literally probably the weirdest thing you ever read, then I think you can enjoy it. It's horrible, okay? There's, like, there's no denying that it's, like, really, really bad, like, in so many- The review that said guilty pleasure is the most accurate. It's most accurate, but it's not even really that. It's just you read it because, like, you want to, like, you just want to understand and, like, absorb it, but you never can because it came from another universe. Nothing shocks me anymore. No, me neither. Now that I've read this book, I'm, like, prepared for anything. We have become Bo, the dead eye Yes! Girl. You read Model Anne and you become Bo. You can stare at a dead cat giving birth to an octopus with nothing in your nope, eyes. Nope, there's... N- my soul has departed my body. I have ascended. <laughs> and with that, we bid you goodbye. Thank you for listening to this crazy episode. 